greet you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. And let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts for the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee, and worthily magnify thy holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord God with all your hearts, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We're going to be able to sing this? Yeah. All right. We're going to sing today. and bodies in the ways of thy laws and in the works of thy commandments, that through thy most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. <clears throat> Grant, we beseech thee, merciful Lord, to thy faithful people, pardon and peace that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve thee with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. first lesson is written in the 65th chapter of the book of Isaiah, beginning at the 17th verse. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them, they shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Here ends the lesson. Thanks be to God. Please join me in reading responsibly those portions of Psalm 30 as printed in the bulletin. I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast drawn me up and hast not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried to thee for help, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, Thou hast brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, 
and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By thy favor, O Lord, thou hast established me as a strong mountain. Thou didst hide thy face. I was dismayed. <clears throat> to thee, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise thee? Will it tell of thy faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness, that my soul may praise thee and not be silent, O Lord my God. I will give thanks to thee forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The epistle is written in the sixth chapter of the letter to the Ephesians, beginning at the tenth verse. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the equipment of the gospel of peace. Besides all these, taking the shield of faith with which you can quench all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that utterance may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Here ends the lesson. Thanks be to God. St. John, starting in chapter 4 and verse 46. Glory, Glory be to thee, O Lord. 
There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son lives. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken to him, and he went his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. And then he inquired of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Thy son lives, and himself believed, and his whole house. This is again the second miracle Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Join with me as we affirm out loud our essential Christian beliefs as contained in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God. The Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and stood on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is Christ and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. My rock and my redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. I'm sure uh, most of you have heard by now that Mary Thomas passed yesterday morning early uh, at Exeter Hospital in Exeter, New Hampshire. She was surrounded by her children and uh, passed peacefully. I was able to visit with her uh, prior to that, shortly before she passed, and perform last rites, and more importantly, to just pray with her and comfort her. She, uh, she had a long battle, and just her lungs collapsed and, and she couldn't come back. So there will be, probably be a service of celebration here next Saturday. I have yet to confirm that, but uh, Peter and I have talked three or four times in the last 12 hours. And uh, You might pray for him. He's struggling, as you could expect, but he has so many kids and grandkids. They, there were probably 30 people in that hospital room uh, when she passed. I mean, they <coughs> filled that room uh, with love, and it was really quite quite beautiful to watch. So I know many of you have, uh, you know, will want to help and, and we'll maybe get a sign-up sheet in the, on the fellowship hall after the service and we can bring some food and things for that uh, celebration. We certainly want to remember her well. She, she had spunk, that woman. She had a scotch and a crab rangoon right before she passed. <laughs> That's Mary. That's Mary I know. 
So, uh, if you can, I want you to process that. Mary is in a better place. She's not hurting. She's not uh, laboring to breathe. She's not in exhaustion. She's frolicking <laughs> through the woods with her Savior. She's having a good time. So, let's be encouraged that we know her and know her faith and we know our Savior. Today, I want to shift our thoughts from that to something entirely different. Uh, we read, in, or rather, uh, Subdeacon Tom read out of Ephesians chapter 6, which is this classic sort of epistle from Paul. He's describing spiritual warfare. He's talking about what it is that we're fighting in our lives, what it is that we come up against. And uh, he's giving the church very specific instructions on how to do battle, how to fight, how to have this war. And there's a phrase in here, and I want to read to you again so that we're all on the same page. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly and supernatural places. End quote. This is a very interesting quote. Paul is describing something that is both in this world and in the other world, right? And we've recently, through science, we've caught up with the Bible. It took us a few thousand years. But we figured out something called quantum mechanics. And we learned that, oh, there are other dimensions. They're actually mathematically proven that there are in other realities, different dimensions beyond the ones that we can measure, see, feel, etc. And so clearly, heaven and hell are in different dimensions, right? So scientifically, it took us over 2,000 years, but we caught up with the Bible and said, oh, there is actual scientific data that proves the idea of heaven and hell and our own existence in different planes. Scientifically, that's really fascinating, but I'm a movie buff. So when I think about spiritual warfare, I get images from movies that help me understand it. And I've been studying in the last three years uh, through the Society of St. Michael to become an exorcist. So I have deeply read and examined the histories and the early writings of the Patristic Fathers. And the best imaging, the absolute, and probably the most accurate, of the entire epic saga of the human race fighting against evil is in this three-book trilogy that Tolkien wrote. The Hobbit. Right? The Twin Towers and Return of the King. Like these, this, this trilogy actually captures pretty close, pretty close to the actual belief of theologians about what happened in heaven. And we sort of blow that off. Like we're like, oh, well, the, the angels are like little cherubs with wings. And I'm like, yeah, where'd that come from? Well, it came from pagan gods called Nikes. And they thought that these little guys were the ones that ate on your soul, right? Like, so when the, when the emperor converted, they had all these little things around all these tombs, these little fat babies with wings that were Nikes, and they're like, well, let's call those angels, right? They just converted the pagan art and made it Christian. Overnight, those were angels. And they couldn't be further from the truth, right? Like, you couldn't absolutely dilute the Bible any more than you possibly could imagine with that little tiny bubbly thing floating around as an angel. And so when you start reading about the angels, you realize, wow, there's a tremendous, tremendous diversity of angelic beings, just like there's a tremendous diversity of earthly beings, right? If you and I were to talk with an elephant, that'd be impressive, right? Like, so how was your day today? It was very heavy, you know, like... <laughs> We, we can't talk with them, but they, we share the planet with them, right? And we're all part of the same zoological sort of kingdom that God has created here on Earth. And yet, you know, you wouldn't identify me with, with an elephant. And, and if you get into studying the supernatural, what Paul clearly did, and you start to understand the hierarchies of angelic creations, you realize there were tremendous differences between one type of angelic being and another. And we sort of lump them all down to these little pagan Nike ideas, these little fat cherub dudes. 
There's not a single fat chair dude in the angelic host, okay? So at the very top, you have cherubim and seraphim. These are dragons. These are, these are beings that their skin is precious metal and diamonds and amethyst and jade. Like, has to be something so tempered by heat it won't melt. So you're looking at, like, these brilliant, beautiful, dazzling beings that have wings and have the ability to withstand tens of thousands of, like the sun's heat, right? They can be in that presence and not melt. So that's a cherubim and seraphim. These are these massive beings that Daniel, Ezekiel, some of the Isaiah, some of these prophets got to see in visions, right? They're like, these things were amazing. Like, wow. Well, one of these beings, a dragon slash seraphim, seraph, in the, in the Latin, means to serpent. That's where the root word serpent comes from. So they were reptilian in a sense, in the fact that they had this dragon-like body and wings. And so one of these, most powerful actually, the one that was in the very presence of God all the time, decided that God wasn't really all that. And he convinced a third of the other angels, which were all lower than him, but powerful. Some of these were things that were like spirits of the elements of the earth, right? Like wind and fire. These pagan ideas all have an angelic root to them. They're not just made up ideas. And so some of these beings were called the sons of God, and we recognize them in the mythologies of these ancient histories. So you've got Greeks, Babylonians, you've got the Persians, you've got... Egyptians, you've got the Romans, and they all describe the same deities, but they give them different names. And these different deities represent, say, the top 100 or 200 angelic forces that rebelled against God. And so these creatures are condemned to leave heaven, that realm. Where'd they go? Here. Here. And so without that basic understanding, right, if you don't have that basic understanding that there are angelic beings that have been cast from the dimension, the quantum dimension of heaven, what we call paradise, because of their sin, they've been cast to our realm, our dimension. And so they're not just one or two. There's millions, right? And these these things have different powers, different characteristics, and different influences. For instance, one of the most powerful that controlled the area of Canaan before the Israelites showed up from Egypt were, were worshiping a priestess, a goddess, by the name of Asherah. The Egyptians called her Isis. Uh, the Romans had another name for her. They all had the same deity, though. This goddess was a sexual lust goddess. And so she was worshipped sexually. So the, the culture was trained to come to the temples on certain nights, certain full moons, and there would be these sort of uncontrolled revelry, right? This sexual interaction with total strangers. And the way that her priests were trained to worship her was to dress as women if you were a man, and if you were a man, to dress as a... See that? <laughs> so all of a sudden, you realize that when God calls the children of Israel into this land that's totally corrupted and polluted with this worship, oh, and the children that were, were brought forth from these ceremonies were then sacrificed in the fire to her, her god brother, Molech, right? So this is some vile corruption, right, of the divine order of God. And so these entities have been physically demonstrated through the culture in pagan times. Now, in Christian times, these entities are influences in our culture. Now, what do you think is happening now? They're coming back. Old demon, new day, right? So these physical and supernatural entities, these powers in high places. We get little glimpses as we go through the history of the Bible. You read about Daniel, who prays in Daniel chapter 10. He's praying to God, I need help, I need an answer, we're in exile. I don't know what to do. 
And God dispatches an angel from heaven immediately to answer Daniel. But the angel doesn't get there for 21 days. Well, what's going on? Is he slow? Was he like the little fat ones that don't move very well? No! It says in Daniel 10 that the prince of the power of Persia withstood him. And it was such a vicious battle that they had to call for reinforcements. And Michael, the archangel, was dispatched from heaven to assist the angel so he could get the answer to Daniel for his prayer. We have this in Scripture. Like, it's written out in Daniel chapter 10. It's crazy, right? Like, you start realizing, oh, you mean when I make a prayer, when I actually pray to God, like, stuff moves in heaven? Yeah. Like, things are dispatched. Entities are told, go, help them, go, protect that. Oh, go, and encourage this person. These are like real physical events. And if you're not careful, you'll separate these events in your mind and you go, oh, well, that just all sort of magic. <laughs> I, I've never read about magic in the Bible. I haven't. I've read about miracles. Miracles are just science that we don't understand. I haven't read about magic. Never once does it say Jesus performed magic. So, you don't have to lose your rational mind to go here. But Paul understood the battle that the children of Israel and Christians in general have been drawn into, right? Because there was this moment in the history, prehistory of the earth, where God just said, enough. Enough. You third of these angelic beings who've seen my glory, know my character. If you've rejected me, that I'm going to create man. And man will be where I place my future. This will be the vehicle for deliverance and the restoration of the cosmos to the divine order. That is where Genesis begins. And if you don't understand that we got walked right into the middle of something, you don't understand what you're dealing with as a Christian. You'll just be deceived and manipulated and completely messed with your whole life because you don't actually grasp what's happening around you. For the Christians, the early church, they understood this all too real, okay? Because they lived in a pagan culture. And so they were seeing all these pagan behaviors and influences right out in the open. We've been in Christian America for 250 years, right? None of that stuff was tolerated. The last time they tried it, they burned them all. Not very far from here. Place called Salem, right? That's real stuff. Like real witches, real, real pagan stuff is real. And so we just haven't seen it because it's been driven sort of under the, the current. But I predict it's going to come right back. And you're beginning to see it in society right now. Now, none of that is meant to be super discouraging. I want you to understand the canvas in which Paul's writing. Let me read it to you again now that I've given you some more context. For our struggle... What struggle? <laughs> to keep your faith. I can't tell you how many Christians I've worked with who they, they were raised in the church, they get into the church, and I was one of them, and you get to a certain point in your life and you're like, this is not how it's supposed to be. My life is nothing like the dream I had for my life. The plans I had, all the goals I had, none of this is working out at all the way I thought. And if you're trying to make sense of the world that's gone crazy without understanding how your faith fits into that crazy, you'll just sort of lose your grip on it and go, okay, I guess, I guess what I believe just wasn't real. And that's what's happening to a lot of people. And so I said, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth. right? I want to tell you the truth, what's happening behind the scenes. And so Paul said that the struggle for your faith is not against flesh and blood, Contending only with physical opponents, but against the rulers. What? What rulers? Well, what happened when Eve took a bite out of that luscious fruit? Well, she convinced her husband, because Eve was hot. She was very hot. Eve was hot. 
Okay, she was the most perfect woman ever made. So Adam's looking at Eve, who is the most beautiful thing he's ever seen, and he's seen God. And he's looking at Eve, and he's like, okay, if I don't take a bite out of this luscious fruit with her, then she's going to be separated from me, and I'm only going to have God, and she's going to have to go away. So I'm going to choose to be with her. Because she's hot. And I would rather be separated from God than lose her. This has been man's struggle ever since. Talk to a man. He's got problems with hot Eve, right? Like it's a thing with men. We get this from who? Our great father, Adam, the first of us. Now, Eve and Adam, when they made this choice, they had been established, according to Genesis, the first two chapters, you can read about it, They've been established as the caretakers, which in spiritual talk is governors. They were the regents of earth. And everything was to be subservient to them. They were in charge of this planet. Spiritually, physically, and in every way, they were in charge. God gave that role to them. When they chose that fruit and each other over God, who got that power? Who became the regents? of this earth, those one-third of those angelic entities said, it's ours now. You've abdicated your role. We'll take it. And thus begins the Bible. That's the start. That, that's all, the, all of that other was prologue, right? So now you've gotten to this point where you're in Genesis 3 and you're like, Oh, and then immediately God speaks the first prophetic phrases of Scripture, and he says, now the seed of the woman will bruise or crush the head of the seed of the snake, and the seed of the snake will bite the heel of the woman. What's he talking about? What Paul's talking about? These things connect. So Genesis 3 is this prophetic word, right? Immediately there's a seed war between the the offspring of the woman and the offspring of Satan. Who the heck is Satan's offspring? Well, there's a whole bunch of them, right? Jesus would call out some of the Pharisees and say, you sons of the devil. (laughs) He would like speak right to it, right? So over time, there's been a war that's emerged between the seed of God and the seed of the devil. This has been the struggle of humanity. This is what's characterized, chronicled in all the Old Testament. And you read about all the different Herazites and the Perizzites and the Amorites and the Wetzelites, right? Those are all seed of the devil. These are all offspring of the devil. And Jesus is chosen to come and do what? Win the battle. He comes as the offspring of the woman, a virgin woman, with none of Adam in him. And now he has established himself as pure, uncorrupted, and holy. And when he takes his place at the cross, all the third of those angelic forces went, oh, blank. That's the guy we've been trying to keep from getting here. And he went right under the radar. They didn't expect him to come from a poverty-stricken family in the middle of Bethlehem. They weren't expecting Jesus to be that. And even when the devil tried to tempt him, they were just feeling him out. Like, could you kill this guy or not? Is he really that one? No, probably not. And Paul writes in the Corinthian letters, he's like, if they'd known who Jesus was, they would have never killed him, right? Why? Because with his death, the stuff that Eve and Adam did way back is atoned for. And because he's a son of man, and Mark would write about that over and over and over and over, he'd take the title son of man. Why? Because it had to be a man that could take back the rule of earth. Had to be a man. Had to be a man that could say, I am now fulfilling the first Adam's role. Now, Paul would write about that in Romans, wouldn't he? The first Adam and the second Adam. He'd say through the second Adam, then all this has been made right. 
And so suddenly you understand scripture a little bit better. You're like, this war has been going on. Jesus has won the war, but the battles are still being fought. And that is the Christian heritage. That's what we live in and under. And Paul's saying, look, these skirmishes are going to continue until the last day. The last day is when Christ returns and he says, okay, you third that did that, you get to go to the lake of fire. And the rest of us will go to the great throne judgment. God will judge graciously and justly to each of us. And Paul is writing to us and saying, look, you cannot forget that you're in this battle. Because the day you forget will be the day that you're overwhelmed. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, powers, and against world forces of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on the complete armor of God so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day. Wow. Wow. And he names it, right? He talks about it. He talks about the different armor that we have and how you can put it on and what it will do for you. But I just want to read to you one single thought. That's practical. You want to talk about this more? I got tons of notes. We can talk about it. But here's the application of this truth. This is the application. Knowing all that's helpful. Because you might just be tempted to think that, well, you know, I just don't feel like going to church. Oh, okay. Wonder where that came from. Hmm. That probably didn't just come from inside of me. That probably came from someone who says, hmm, seed of Adam. When they allow Christ to come through them into this world, they bring what? Light into the darkness. And when lots of seeds of Adam come together with Christ, they get brighter and brighter. And so we don't want that. So one of their first offensives is, you're too busy for that. You don't feel quite right. You're kind of extra tired this week. And anyway, that person looked at you weird last week. And you know, they're not always that kind to me. And you know, no one really notices my new hair. And nobody really noticed that I was having a hard time. These things come in like avalanche, man. It's just... And you can believe it if you're not careful. You can actually believe that stuff. It just isn't true. So you got to armor up. you got to say, no, I'm going to pick up my shield of faith and go, no, that's not true. I know that God says, don't forsake the assembly of yourself together. So I'm going to be where he's called me to be, and I'm going to serve where he's called me to serve, and I'm going to be faithful when I feel like it and when I don't feel like it. I'm going to stick with what this is that he's called me to do. Okay, that's faith. That steps up and says, no, I don't have to listen to that. No, I don't have to submit to that. No, I'm not under your authority anymore. I serve Christ. I'm no longer a piece of wood in a big ocean. I've got a raft. <laughs> so here's how this looks in real life. How do you know when to armor up? What does that look like? There's a lady that I know very well. She served the diocese for many years. She's very private. She's a very um, careful woman. So that's why I'm not using her name. She's diagnosed with breast cancer just a few weeks ago, and she'd had it 20 years earlier. And this time it's scaring her. She's in her late 60s. And I noticed in some meetings that I saw her with this last week, that she wasn't herself. And I came up to her and I said, are you okay? She said, no, I'm not. I'm freaking out. So I said, can I, can I pray with you? Now, there's hundreds of priests walking around, right? She said, I was the only one that prayed for her. Now, this morning, I sent her an email because she goes into surgery in the morning. I said, just wanted you to know that we're praying for you at St. Margaret's and I'm claiming this verse to be true for you. And I put 2 Corinthians 1. Verse 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort that we ourselves are comforted by God. 
For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in his comfort too. Amen. First Corinthians. That's like picking up my sword and saying, no, no, the word of God says this is true. I'm not taking that. I'm not going to let you take that. I'm going to stand over her in faith. I'm holding my shield over her and my sword. And I'm saying, that's what that text, that email was. No, don't you give in to that fear. Don't you give in to that despair. Don't you give in to that doubt. So when we fight spiritual warfare, it's not just about us. It's not just about, okay, I'm going to stand firm. It's like you take up your shield of faith and you pray for other people. You stand for them when they can't. Peter could use some people praying over him in the spirit this week, claiming promises for him, shielding him from the darts of the enemy. And this then gets really practical, doesn't it? Because the spirit of God goes through a church like ours and he sort of touches people on the shoulder and goes, hey, um, did you notice she's not quite right? Okay, why don't you go ask her how she's doing? Uh, oh, and then he'll tell Bob. Bob, have you, have you talked to your wife? She's a little down today. Oh, man, I would have missed that. And then, and then sometimes she, the Holy Spirit will come and tap someone else. You should reach out and text so-and-so. You haven't talked to them in like six weeks. Check and see if they're okay. This is spiritual warfare. This is claiming the truth of God over the circumstances someone may be in. Now, it's not magic. When you claim the truth of God over someone, when you pray for someone, when you stand with them in, in the spiritual war, you're not able to necessarily, like, magically cure what ails them. But you can bring hope to them. You can bring peace to their anxiety. And you can bring strength to them when they feel too weak to go on. That is what the church has been charged to do. And it has been the commission of the church since the very beginning. But over the last 2,000 years, we've sort of diluted the severity of this war. We've sort of pushed it off in a metaphor and illusion and allegory and symbolism. And it's literal. Literal. So when you look at something in Hamas or Gaza and you go, what the heck? Well, yeah. Yeah. There's, war. There's spiritual battles going on. As Christians, we have the ability to influence our culture. We have the, imp the ability to influence our towns, our schools, our, our homes, right? So these, these truths can be presented as real, valid prayers that can free a home from anything from a demonic infestation to a, a town that's full of despair and joblessness, right? And so the church has been given the authority, the keys, all of the stuff that it needs to bind and to loose and to do all the stuff that needs to be done for God's kingdom to be here on earth. So, let's be about that this Halloween, which is in two days. Father, I'm out of time, so you speak to your people the way, Holy Spirit, that you want them to hear this. But well, this is a war, and we've been thrust into it, and we have a champion who won the battle. He won it all. So help us now to channel him, to walk in his might, to walk in his power, and to claim the Bible, the words of God, as the truth that they are in the lives that we face every day. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Where's Bob? That was way over. Sorry. <laughs> Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive.
saint of Christ. Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications, to give thanks for all men, we humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our alms and oblations and to receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree on the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also so to direct and dispose the hearts of all Christian rulers that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here, present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And so, Father, we remember Nancy, who has breast cancer, for Parker, a child fighting cancer. We pray for Mike, who has stroke and is dealing with dementia, for Pauline, who's got Parkinson's and memory loss. And we think of Alicia and Jacob, who need help with their mental well-being, for Mary and her family, for Marissa and Josh, Riley and Jay, as they're in a new chapter of their life. We pray for Philip and Sarah Tarantino, fighting lung and prostate cancer. We think of Greg and Carol, for caretaker stress and fatigue, and for strength, she cares for Greg. And Lord, we do remember our dear sister, Mary Thomas. May she rest in peace in your presence, and we are going to miss her. Comfort Peter and her family in this sudden loss. I pray that you'll give strength to them. Their faith would not grow weaker, but stronger in the midst of this grief. And Father, I think of the city of Lewiston, Maine, and the terrible loss of 18 lives. Evil. Evil from heavenly places that has come to earth is corrupting us. And so, Father, for the people of Lewiston, we have no idea what that feels like, but you do. And so comfort them as only you can. Give them the strength they need, and may their faith fail not. May they find renewed hope. May you bind back the darkness in that town. And may your light bearers come forth, your Christians. May they spread hope all among the people and the children in that town. And may the devil not win there. We ask this in Jesus' name. And so we bless your holy name for all thy servants who departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy service and love, and to give us grace so to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant us, O oh Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Now you who do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God, devoutly kneeling. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and we have our hands and sins, which we from time to time most grievously have committed, by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us, we do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. 
Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in the midst of life. To the honor and glory of thy name. For Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those with hearty repentance and true faith, turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear what comfortable words our Savior Christ saith unto all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. So God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hear also what St. Paul saith, and this is a true saying, it's worthy of all men to be received that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Here also what St. John saith, if any man said, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. And lift up your hearts. And lift them up unto the Lord. And let us give thanks unto our Lord God. He is indeed and our it is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God. Therefore, with the angels, the archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord Most High. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to thee, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, that thou of thy tender mercy did give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. Who made there, by his one oblation of himself, once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that as precious death and sacrifice until it's coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son has commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread 
and wine. That we receiving them, according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, and remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise, thanksgiving. Most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present to thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and our bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others we shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction and made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy for a manifold sin to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this, our bounden duty and service not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom, with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table. Thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood. That our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed from his precious, precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that thou should come under my roof, but the seed of the world.
Notice the words you just sang. Yeah. Yeah. This has been under the radar for a while. But the church is supposed to know. So let's stay awake, shall we? All right. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank Thee for that Thou dost not save to feed us, who have duly received these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of Thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of Thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate in the mystical body of Thy Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom, by the merits of his most precious death and passion. We humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may be in the fellowship, and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us so often, through Jesus Christ our Lord. To whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Amen. You want to sing this? Yes. Yes. All right. Lead. every day. I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Stand if you will. If you are. Great. <laughs> the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you. Oh.